Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunday School. Today, my calendar tells me is April 19th, and we have been doing Sunday School at home now for three weeks. Um, I hope you all had a good week from wherever you're watching from and that you have a good day today and that you just put the Lord first today. This is the Lord's day, it is a special day, and I'm glad that even though we're not together personally at church, we can still honor him by making this day the Lord's day, and we can um, just worship him and learn more about him today. And I hope that the Sunday school is a little part of your day today that you can learn more about the Lord and what he has to teach all of us. You know, when I study and pray about what I'm gonna do for a Sunday school lesson, I find that often it's, especially in today's lesson, it's something that I need to apply in my own life. So today our Sunday school lesson is going to be from the book of Acts. Now you remember last week when we talked about the Easter story, we were in the book of John. Well, this is just the next book over. So if you go and get your Bible and you find the book of Acts, we're gonna be here in chapter 27 and chapter 28. Now, chapter 27 is quite long, and unfortunately, because we only have a little bit of time for video Sunday school, we can't go through the whole chapter, but I'm going to encourage you that this week, either by yourself or with your family, that you read through Acts chapter 27, because it's just a wonderful chapter. It's one of my favorite chapters in the New Testament, and we can't go through it all today, but read it at home. I think you'll really enjoy it and see um, how the Lord worked things out in a, in a very difficult situation for the Apostle Paul, who's gonna be our main character in our story today. Now, if we were having Sunday school, you were in my class and everything was normal, the way it used to be, we would be doing a series, okay? So it would just, it would mean that for maybe four or five or six weeks, we would go through a certain series in our Sunday school class. Maybe we would look at the life of, of a Bible character. We would think of a topic, something we wanted to study out, maybe a book of the Bible. Well, for video Sunday school, we're not going to be doing that. So my very next lesson isn't going to be what happened right after the Easter story. And the reason for that is this. As much as I like doing series and pulling all these things together, we can't do that in video school, Sunday school, because we actually don't know how long we're going to be doing this video Sunday school or when we'll be back to normal and we can be in our Sunday school classrooms at our churches again. So for that reason, I don't want to be halfway through a story or halfway through a series and then realize, oh, we're not recording anymore and leave everyone with a cliffhanger. So every Sunday school from now on, every Sunday, as long as we're able to do this, is going to be different. Perhaps next week we'll be back in the Old Testament. Like I said, today we're going to be in the book of Acts and we're going to be learning about the Apostle Paul. Some of you may have already known about his life and studied maybe even this very story I'm telling you today. So that's awesome. But right now we're going to take just a little part of his life and have a lesson about that today, okay? Um, before we do that, though, I'm going to give you a quick uh, story about something that happened about a hundred years ago, and you're going to see how we're going to tie it all together. And then we're going to have our Bible lesson um, from Acts, and then at the very end, we're going to do a real quick object lesson, okay? And then we'll say goodbye for another week. Uh, the object lesson isn't exactly something that you can try at home. Maybe half of it is. Part of it might be but the other half you don't want to try at home, and please don't try it at home, you might get me in trouble, um, but we'll look forward to that at the end of the video. But first I want to tell you about something, this is a true story that happened about 100 years ago in the United States, in the southern states, um, and it has to do with a bug. <laughs> now, How many of you like bugs? Does anyone, do you have any fans out there, of people that are fans of bugs, of insects? I have to say that I don't hate I don't hate insects. I don't hate bugs. Like they don't terrify me or scare me or anything. Um, I don't mind them. I don't like them though. I don't, I don't love bugs. And I especially do not like insects or bugs when they're in my home. I don't mind if I see them outside, that's fine. But I just don't like them when they're in my home. That's when they really become a pest. But our story that we're going to open up with, and then we're going to see how it ties together with something that happened in the life of Paul, a Bible character. Our story is about something called a boll weevil. A boll weevil. I'm going to put it up here on the screen. You can see what it looks like. A hundred years or so ago, a really um, important crop that the farmers were growing in the southern United States was cotton, cotton crops. 
cotton was an important crop that the farmers were growing in order to be able to uh, feed their family and keep a roof over their head and keep the towns in, in um, the, the towns there in the south growing. And so cotton was a really important crop. Well, you know this little bull weevil that I'm telling you about, this little tiny beetle, this bug? Guess what the bull weevil's favorite food was? Favorite thing to eat? Cotton. They loved a cotton crop. And so as these bull weevils came up and started migrating up into the southern states, they found the Alabama farmers' cotton crops and they were delicious. Good news for the bull weevils, very, very, very bad news for the farmers, especially in Alabama, where the story is going to take place. Well, it's really sad, but overnight, almost, almost overnight, like immediately, when the swarms of boll weevils came and descended over the crops there in Alabama and the other uh, southern states there, they, the crops, the farms, they were gone almost overnight was a terrible thing for a farmer to see the swarm of bugs coming in and falling on his crops and eating them all. And these farmers, this is about 100 years ago, 1917 or 18 or so, they were absolutely devastated. It was something really sad and terrible that was happening in their communities and in their farms. And now they went from lovingly, you know, put in with really hard work, putting out their crops, planting them, getting them to grow up and being ready to harvest them. And then they were gone. There was no income. There was no money. There was no cotton. The boll weevils had come and eaten it all. So what did they do? They didn't know what to do. It was a terrible, terrible time for these poor farmers at this time. Well, they decided, they, they got together and they were talking about it and they said, let's try to grow something that really no one had been doing very much of lately. And what it was, was a peanut crop. They were gonna start farming peanuts. Now we know now that peanuts are a wonderful crop, but back then it wasn't something that people had done. Those of you who have been in my Sunday school and junior church, we've talked, we told you the story about a wonderful scientist who was a Christian, he got his secrets from God because he prayed to God and asked God to help him discover these secrets of the earth. And his name was George Washington Carver. You ever heard of him? And he was one of these scientists and he in studying the land and all these things, he found out that peanuts were a wonderful thing to grow. He found uh, hundreds of uses, hundreds of things you could make from the tiny peanut. And so he was encouraging um, people to change to peanut crops. Well, the, the, the farmers in Alabama, they said, okay, let's start. We're, we don't have, we all have anything to lose. Our crops are gone. Let's start farming peanuts. And they did. And the boll weevils didn't come back and eat them because they didn't want peanuts. They just ate cotton, right? And so they, they had these peanut crops and they, they made money. They were so prosperous. And then everybody was buying peanuts from these farmers in southeastern Alabama. And it was a wonderful thing it turned into. In fact, this little county in Alabama is called Coffee County. And the town of Enterprise is the one that we're talking about that has, that we're going to tell you actually has a statue about this, these things that happened 100 years ago. Well, this county of Coffee County, Alabama became the most, the biggest producer of peanuts in the entire United States. And now they went from having no money, no income, no food on the table to making a wonderful living. They were able to grow their town and help their families and their neighbors. And it was really the best thing that happened to that town and to that county in a long, long time. And it all started because of something bad, because of this bow weevil that had come and eaten up their entire wonderful crop of cotton. And so to this day, if you go to the little town of Enterprise, Alabama, right in the middle of town, there is a statue, there is a monument. And the monument is not in thanks and gratitude to the peanut that changed their lives 100 years ago. It's actually a monument to the bow weevil. It is actually, if you go there today, you'll see it. And it says that the, the grateful citizens of this town had put up this monument to say, thank you to the bow weevil. But does that make sense? A pest, something that came and destroyed everything they'd worked so hard for? It doesn't make sense until you know the rest of the story and you realize 
that if that insect hadn't come in and eaten up everything they'd worked so hard for, they would never have tried peanut farming and made a wonderful living from farming peanuts. They would never have done it. And so the reason I'm telling you this story before we get to our Bible story, I really want you to listen carefully to this because this is a lesson that isn't just for you right now as a young person in 2020. This is something that if you learn this lesson, you can carry it through your whole life and it will change the way you look at life and how you let God use you. And here's the lesson. It's that oftentimes, I would definitely say most times, things that come into our lives that may seem bad, that may seem negative, God can and will and does turn them into something wonderful, something positive. He can take the bad that come into our lives because that's, that's part of life, that some things come into our lives that are hard or difficult, and he can turn them into a blessing, from bad to a blessing, because that is how God does things. He sees the whole picture. He's an all-powerful God who loves you and me. And he knows that sometimes difficult things come into our lives. Kind of like right now, we have a hard time that we're all going through. It doesn't matter where you live. We're all kind of in the same boat. There's so many things that we can't do, that we can't have, people we can't visit. Life isn't normal right now. And really, we can look at it as a, a hard thing, a difficult thing, a negative in our lives here in the spring of 2020. That's true. And God knows it's difficult. He's with us through it. We talked about that last week. What can be like, you remember that bull weevil that came into the people's town and ruined everything? And then something good happened out of it? See, there was a really big problem caused by something very, very, very tiny, a bug. The big problem caused by a little tiny something. And right now, we in our world, we have a big problem that's caused by something even tinier than an insect. It's actually caused by a virus that we can't even see. It's so tiny, we can't see it with our, own, with, our, with our eyes. But God says, I know about that. I know that there's something hard going on. I know it's difficult. These things are hard to get used to. And it's, um, he says, I'm going to use this time, even this difficulty that we're in today, and I'm going to use it to make good things happen. And now I'm sure all of you can even make a list right now, if you really thought about it, of some good things that have happened. And you can, you can ask the Lord to help you to look for the good things through this time, not just to list the bad things, okay? And I'm definitely talking to myself in this way too. We all need to learn this lesson, that God can take things that are negative or difficult in our life and he could turn them into or use them for something wonderful, something good, something that draws us closer to him, something that gives him the glory, something maybe that even is going to cause our friends, our neighbors, our family, someone to know about Jesus and come to him and hear about his love for them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't that be worth it even? So let me pick up my Bible here, and we're going to go to our Bible story now. So if you can find the book of Acts, and we're going to start in chapter 27. Now, because we're limited in time in our video Sunday school, I can't give you a whole lesson on who the Apostle Paul was and what he was doing here in chapter 27. If you, you, you can read it for yourself, though. If you want to have some, some quiet time with the Lord, you don't really know where to read, start in the book of Acts. It actually, the story picks up right after Jesus went back to heaven, as he said, after he rose from the dead. Remember, that's the Easter story last week. Well, the apostle Paul, he was such a special servant of the Lord. And he and his team, they went through so many cities, and it wasn't an easy time to be a missionary. It is never an easy time to be a missionary. In chapter 27, in Acts 27, Paul was on his way to Rome but it wasn't one of his missionary journeys. He was actually going to Rome as a prisoner. He had been arrested. The religious leaders, they didn't like him preaching the gospel. They didn't like him talking about that Jesus was the Messiah and they had killed and crucified him. They didn't want to hear the truth. The devil did not want the gospel to spread. Well, as they're coming along, the, 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 the weather started to get not very good. 
And Paul, he knew that they were going to run into trouble. Because remember, he had God speaking into his heart. He had the Holy Spirit. And so as they were coming along in verse 9, so I'm in chapter 27, verse 9 in my Bible, if you want to read along. It says that now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous, the weather was getting quite bad. Paul, he stood up to the people and he said, I, I have something to say to you men. The centurion that was in charge, he's the one that got the, the, um, the, the ship sailing into Italy and the captain of the ship. And he said in verse 10, sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading or the cargo that we have on board and the ship, but also of our lives. And he said, we need to stop here because... There is going to be a storm. God has explained this to me. And I, I know, I perceive in my heart that I don't believe it's safe for us to go any farther. But the centurion, he said in verse 11, it says that he believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things that were spoken of by Paul. He didn't want to listen to Paul, who was listening to God. He wanted to listen to the person who owned the ship, the, the, the pilot of the ship, because did they want to stay in a place that that, you know, maybe they just said, that wasn't as pleasant of a place to spend the winter in. We don't want to stay there. I've got cargo. I'm going to get rid of these prisoners on my ship. Let's keep going. So he listened to them. They didn't want to stay there any longer. And so they kept going. And for a while, it says that the south wind blew softly. We read in verse 13, it seemed like things were going fine. But Paul knew better. He had been listening to God and he knew that a really hard time was going to come. And Paul wasn't going to escape it. He was going to be in the same storm as the other people on the ship. And not long after, I read in verse 14, arose against it a tempestuous wind. It was like a cyclone or a hurricane. Has anyone ever been in a hurricane? We had a hurricane here in Halifax just last, was it September? Maybe last fall, we had quite the hurricane. We lost power, trees fell down, and as scary, a little bit scary, unsettling as the hurricane was here in the safety of my own home with brick walls. I couldn't imagine being in a hurricane out in the middle of the ocean. That wasn't a place you'd want to be. And that's exactly where Paul, the Apostle Paul, and all the people on board, that's the situation they found themselves in. It was a bad situation, the storm, but it got worse. In verse 20, we read, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared. That means that the storm was so dark, they couldn't tell if it was nighttime or daytime. They hadn't seen the sun in days. And no small tempest lay on us. They write, oh, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. They had no hope. They realized we're gonna die in this ship, in the middle of this big cyclone on the sea. It says, after a long time, Paul stood up and he got all the people to listen to him. And listen to this, what Paul said. He stood forth in the midst of them and he said, sirs, he gave them a fact. Ye should have hearkened unto me. Remember when I told you all that time ago that we should have stopped, that we should have not left Crete, the island where it was safe? And then he said, we wouldn't have this harm and this loss. We wouldn't have had to lose the ship. We wouldn't have had to throw all the cargo overboard. And he wasn't bragging. He was just giving a fact that God had, had laid it on his heart that they shouldn't have gone any farther. And they did. And he said, sirs, you should have listened to me. But in verse 22, he said, now I exhort you, or I encourage you to be of good cheer. Cheer up be encouraged. It's going to be okay. For there shall no loss, there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. He said, we're going to lose the ship. It will be broken up. The ship will not survive the storm. But none of us are going to lose our lives. How did Paul know this? Because again, God is with him and God was speaking to him. And he gave the testimony in verse 23. For there stood by me this night, the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. See, God had a plan for Paul. And God's plan for Paul was to go to Rome. 
and nothing on this earth was going to stop God's plan because God is the one in control. And so he stood by Paul that night and he visited him just like we talked about last week when Jesus came and stood in the midst of the disciples and told them, peace be unto you. Do not be afraid. And the same Jesus, he stood by Paul that night and he said, Paul, be encouraged in your heart because I have a plan. Even though everything looks like it's going wrong, I am in control, Paul, and you can be encouraged. And then give that message to the others. Be encouraged. No one here will lose their life. But look at verse 25. He says, wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. Be encouraged. For I believe God. That's all he asks of us is to believe him. that He's in control, even in the middle of a storm. That it shall be even as it was told me. And in verse 26, it says, how be it? We must be cast upon a certain island. Because remember, the ship wasn't going to survive. But all the men on that ship were going to live. They were going to survive. Well, you can read all the verses yourself because we don't have time to do it. The, the, the storm was just tossing that ship and they couldn't see land. They were hoping for the day. And Paul stood up and he said, now everybody, it's time. Let's all take some meat. Let's all have something to eat because we're going to have a big swim ahead of us. We are going to, this ship is going to wreck. And so we see in verse 24, wherefore I pray you or I encourage you, take some meat for this is for your health. There shall not an hair fall from the head of any of you. God has you. No one is going to lose their life today. And when he had thus spoken, he took bread and he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all. The soldiers, the centurion, the Roman who was in charge of the prisoners, all the prisoners, the captain of the ship, the sailors. He said, I want you to eat. And he thanked God for the food in the presence of them all. You might say, how can he be thankful at a time like that? The storm was still raging and there was a hurricane upon them and their ship was going to be broken up. But Paul said, I'm going to be thankful for this food. God is in control, even though things seem really out of control. I trust God. I believe God. And as a testimony, he thanked God for the food before they ate. Then verse 36, they all were all good cheer and they took some meat. And we were in all in the ship, 203 score and 16 souls. That's a lot of people. Is God powerful enough to keep all of those people alive when they shipwreck? Of course. God is in control of everything. And so it says, when it was day, they knew not the land. They couldn't even see if they were close or not. And they put out the anchors, it says, and the ship was crashed into this place where the two seas meet. They realized they were getting shallower and shallower and finally the ship ran aground and it stuck fast in the sandbar there. Remember Paul said they were gonna be cast upon a certain island and they were, but the back part of the ship completely broke apart. It says the hinder part was broken in verse 41 with the violence of the waves, the storm was still so hard and the soldiers counsel, now their job, we read in verse 42, these Roman soldiers who had the charge of these prisoners, their job was if anything like this ever happened, they had to kill the prisoners. They wouldn't let the waves do it. They would have to kill the prisoners because they were responsible that these prisoners not escape. And so that was their job. But the centurion, we read in verse 43, willing to save Paul, he kept them, he told the soldiers no, just let everyone swim. He commanded them that they should swim. They which could swim should cast themselves first into the sea. He said, if you can swim, doesn't matter if you're a sailor or a prisoner or a missionary, if you can swim, you go first. Jump into the sea and see if you can swim to land. And the Bible says that on the, and the rest, some on board, some on broken pieces of the ship, and they all made their way to the island that they had come to. And so it came to pass, the Bible says, that they escaped all safe to land. Not one person's life had been lost. Not from the storm, not from a soldier, not from the cold that they were gonna have afterwards. They all made it safely. Did they have to go through a storm? Yes. Did they have to go through a very scary time where they couldn't even see the sun for days? And the ship was being tossed up and down and they didn't know if they, they all had to go through that. 
But God says, it's okay. I'm going to get you safe on the other side. And he did. How is he going to turn this very scary and bad experience into something good in the life of the Apostle Paul and the others with him? Well, we read in verse 28, when they were escaped, they'd all safely got out of the ocean. They were freezing cold, but they were safe. They were alive. Then they knew that the island was called Melita. So this island wasn't a deserted island. People lived there. It was the island of Melita. And the Bible says in verse 2 that the, the people that were there, they were very kind. They made a big fire so they could warm themselves. Here these people had come through a terrible storm, shipwrecked on their island, and the people were showing them kindness. And Paul, he was helping. We read here that when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, he was out with the other men gathering up sticks to make this fire so they could all get warm after being in the ocean. And there came a viper out of the heat and it fastened on his hand. It didn't even come up out of the, out of the fire and, and bite him and slither away. It fastened on his hand because Paul was there. He was picking up sticks and he was helping and contributing to the, to the work that had to be done. But he picked up some sticks and in his sticks that he had, there was a snake in it. It was a viper and it was something that had venom, meaning that it was, it was a poisonous snake. And so when the people saw that, the minute the, those sticks hit the fire and the viper came out, sorry to scare you guys, but this is what happened. The viper came out fastened on Paul's hand. And the people that were watching, you know what they said? They watched and they said, oh, this man, he's going to die. He must be a murderer. They were very superstitious and they knew that there were prisoners on the ship. And so they said, this guy here, he escapes out of the shipwreck and the gods, you know, because they, they worshiped all sorts of false, not true gods. And they said, they are having revenge on him. He did, he survived the shipwreck and now they sent a serpent to come out and bite him and this man has to die. But in verse five, we read, he shook off the beast into the fire and Paul felt no harm. How be it they looked when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they, they watched Paul for a good while, he didn't fall down. He didn't start swelling up. The poison hadn't entered his body. They saw that no harm had come to him and they changed their minds. And they said, oh, he's probably not a human being like us. He's probably one of the gods that have come down from, from heaven. And, 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 and Paul did not want them to think that at all. Who was taking care of him? One of the many false gods that those people worshiped? Or the one true God, Jesus Christ. Jesus was taking care of him. And so the people, they started to listen to Paul and they watched him. And do you know, these people, you know, the Bible says that, that they had thought he was a God, meaning they didn't know Jesus Christ. They didn't know of the one true God. They worshiped false gods. This island wasn't a place where the gospel had been, I don't think. I mean, we read that they they really thought that there was, there was gods, many, many false gods. And now here, what we might think of as an accident, a ship is wrecked in the middle of the sea and comes to this island. And on the ship is the missionary, Paul, who knows the one true God and is able to tell them the gospel. Does that seem like an accident to you? Or does that seem like something that God had planned because he loved the people on that island? Well, the chief of the island, he was very kind to Paul and to his friends. We read here that he received us and he, he lodged us three days courteously, made sure that they had food to eat and a roof over their head and they were nice and warm. He treated them very well. Well, this chief of this village, his father was sick and he lay dying. He was very, very sick. And Paul, he entered in, he went and visited this man. We read in verse eight, he prayed to the one true God of heaven, the only God who can heal. And Paul laid his hands on this man's father and he healed him. And then the people started talking. Did you know that there's a man who's come to our island who knows the one true God and he has God's power to heal? And so we read that when this was done, others also, which had diseases in the island, they came and they were healed. They'd come to Paul and Paul, we know Paul 
We know what the Bible says about him. He wasn't going around saying, look at my power, look what I can do. The reason God was healing these people was because he loved them and he had compassion on them and he wanted them to listen and to know the one true God and his son, Jesus Christ, who he had sent. So was it a mistake? Was it a terrible, terrible thing that Paul ended up on this island? How long was Paul there? We read in verse 10, the people honored them with many honors. They were kind to them and gave them things. All the things that they had lost on the ship, they had, had it so much given back to them. They were given gifts and the things that they needed. And in verse 11, it said that after three months, a ship came along and they left. That was three months time that Paul and the other believers were there on the island of Melita, which is now Malta. And they were able to heal people, people that were going to die and spend an eternity without Christ. He was able to tell people the gospel for three months and really teach them. So you know what that story teaches me, how it encourages my heart? You might think that a shipwreck was a big mistake. A shipwreck was a terrible trial. It was a scary time when things seemed out of control. And God said, I'm going to take that shipwreck and I'm going to turn something wonderful out of it. Those soldiers on the ship, they were never the same again because of what they saw, I'm sure. The other prisoners, the centurion, the sailors, the captain, and definitely those people on that island. Their whole lives, they were never the same again. How many of them got saved? When we get to heaven, we're going to find out. We are going through a time right now that is not like a shipwreck, but it's hard. It's difficult. Things aren't the way we want them to be. And we can spend the whole time, I can do it, you can do it, saying, this is a negative. This is a bad thing. This is a shipwreck. This is a bull weevil. I don't want this to happen. Or we can spend this time saying, Lord, it's happening. It's not fun. It's not comfortable. It's not easy. I'd rather be at church today. I'd rather be at school. I'd rather see my family. I'd rather see my friends. But you, Lord, you are in control. What good things are you going to bring out of this? Maybe people will get saved. Maybe families will be closer together. Even think about you at home. Do you always, I'm not sure everybody is able to see their mom and their dad all day. You know, they have to go to work and you might miss that time. You can make a whole list of the good things that have come out of this coronavirus that's happened in our world. And God is still working. He's doing amazing things, even at a time that's not good. Here's the last thing I want to leave you with. We're going to do a quick object lesson. How many of you that are listening to me this morning, how many of you like popcorn? <laughs> I pop some popcorn and you can see I've kind of eaten off the top. I like popcorn. Popcorn's great. It's, it's tasty, especially the buttery kind. Mm, so, so good. Did you know though, that popcorn, in order for it to get like this, something that we can eat and enjoy, it doesn't start out this way. How does popcorn get to be tasty and wonderful? Well, I have a few popcorn kernels and you're not going to be able to see them because they're so tiny and I'm just using the webcam on my camera today, but look at that. The popcorn kernel is actually completely hard. If you bit down on it, you might break a tooth. You couldn't get filled up by it. It's not a great snack. It's just a popcorn kernel. When does the popcorn kernel turn from the hard thing that you can't really even chew into something wonderful, a snack? Do you know when it turns into that? It's when it goes to the heat and when it goes into the microwave and you put heat to this little popcorn kernel and it pops and it becomes something yummy and something wonderful. But if this popcorn kernel, if it could talk and it said, I don't want to go into the heat. I don't want to go over the stove. I don't want to go into the microwave where it's hot. This will just continue to be just a plain old popcorn kernel. Not really good for too much. But when it goes into the microwave or it gets popped over the stove, it becomes something really wonderful. And in the same way, 
this is this is the object lesson you can do at home you can pop some popcorn and think about this in the same way in our lives if everything was easy if we never had any time where we had sadness or something that makes us cry or feel lonely or difficult if we never had anything hard in our lives God could miss opportunities to do some wonderful things. I know we don't like hard times. I, I talked about that. I realize that. I don't like it. You don't like it. But we can say, Lord, what good thing could you bring out of it in this heat? One last thing I'm going to show you. This one you can't do at home because I don't want anyone to ruin your kitchen. But I can do it because I'm going to try. I've actually never tried this and I want to try it out. If you put something in the microwave that's not supposed to be in the microwave, then don't do it. It'll ruin it. It could even ruin your microwave. It could ruin your kitchen, okay? Only certain things can go in the microwave and come out okay. One of them, obviously, is popcorn. But there's something very special that you can put in a microwave that completely changes. And it is a bar of soap. Now, not just any soap. Do not put any soap in your microwave, okay? Do not do this. Do not try this at home. If you put any kind of soap in your microwave, it'll absolutely ruin your microwave. It'll ruin the soap. It's not good, and it could be very dangerous. But there, of all the types of soap in the world, there is only one kind that when you put it in the microwave, something wonderful happens to the soap. Everything else will ruin your microwave, ruin the soap, except this brand right here. It's called Ivory Soap. And I'm going to show you what is so special about Ivory Soap. I'm going to open this here. See, it says Ivory. I guess you probably can't see that in there. But Ivory Soap. If you put a bar of Ivory Soap and you put it in the hot, hot microwave and you leave it there for just even one minute. Do you know what happens to the ivory soap? I'm going to show you. I'm going to go put it in the microwave and I'll bring it back to show you what it looks like. All right, well I'm back. I put the ivory soap in the microwave. Do you want to see what it turns into? It's not ivory soap anymore. My kitchen, by the way, smells amazingly wonderful. But this is what happens to our bar of soap. It actually expands. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It smells wonderful. You can, you can kind of play with it. If I just even kept it in there a little longer, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when I brought it in here to my office, it got smaller. But you know what? It's not even the same. And I know it's kind of a silly illustration because why would you put soap in the microwave? But the point is there's many, many, many kinds of soap and you put one in the microwave and don't do that. But if you, there's many kinds, you put one in the microwave, it's gonna ruin, ruin the soap. It's gonna ruin everything, it's dangerous. But there's one kind of soap, only one that's different, that when you put it in, it expands, it gets bigger, it gets bubbly. Your whole kitchen smells wonderful, it smells like ivory soap. There's only one that when it goes into something hot, something even better comes out of it, like popcorn. And like us as Christians, if you go into a time that is difficult, it's kind of hot, it's something you don't want to go through, but in the end, something better, something bigger, a blessing is going to come out of it. That is exactly what God wants us to be. He doesn't want us to be ordinary soap. He wants us to be ivory soap, <laughs> right? If that makes sense, probably only to my older ones, I'm sure maybe the younger ones that went right over your head. But God wants us to take the bad things in our life that do happen and say, Lord, what can you do with them to make them better? That's why I have the very last verse I'm going to leave you with, and then we're going to say goodbye for this week. It's in Romans. Now, Paul also wrote these words. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit, but Paul wrote these words, and he knew what he was talking about. He'd been through that shipwreck and many other things that were negatives in his life, and God worked them all together for good. In Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things, the bad things and the good things, and God works them all together 
so that we give the glory to him. We're closer to him and others can see through you, through me and say, I want to know more about the Lord. I want to know more about this God that you serve. Like they talked to Paul after that shipwreck. So that is my prayer for you, for me, for all of us as we listen to this message that we will say, Lord, how can you bring something good out of Let me see something good. Let me look for the blessings that you can have during this time. And so I hope you're all have a great, you, you all have a great week, uh, the week ahead. And the Lord willing, I'll see you again next Sunday for another Sunday school. Bye.